Welcome to everybody uh, for joining the IRM's uh, webinar on risk resilience and recovery in a COVID-19 world. So we are now at four o'clock. So I'm going to introduce now um, our, uh, our host for this afternoon, which is um, Dr. Nick Gowing. So Nick, um, now if we can have the video feed to Nick, please. Are you there, Nick? Yes, I am. Are you seeing me? I'm seeing a picture of you on the screen, and I, th I, I, I think I'm going to see your your video feed very soon. All right, uh, Rory, have you have you fed the feed through, please? Mm -hmm. Okay. We just need to click it. <laughs> okay. Keep talking, Nick, because we can see you even if we're a, a few seconds behind on seeing. All right. You. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nick Gowing. Uh, I'm the founder and co-director of the Thinking the Unthinkable Project. Um, and the Thinking the Unthinkable Project is about thinking what you are not aware of, about realizing the kind of things which are coming down the track, which actually you don't really want to even consider. So uh, we've been working, I and my colleague Chris Langton have been working on how to understand how leaders are really struggling in this new environment. It's the leaders who can't see. And the reason I'm saying this right at the beginning is because I, as the, the, the chair at this moment, am sort of saying, you've got to think far more radically about what you define risk as. It's not about accepting the current definitions of risk. It's about being far bolder, far, having far greater, deeper mindsets on this, being expansive and realizing the existential threat. It's not just me saying that. I've just been on a webinar with uh, Mark Carney, who's uh, now the UN envoy for climate action and finance. And he was saying very clearly at the British Academy of all places that a resilience must be reinforced and reinvented. Reinvented, he said. We must protect against risk you do not or cannot imagine. And surely that was what COVID-19 has been about. Except, of course, it had been warned about. It had been imagined. The science said it would happen any time and was inevitable at some point, what we call thinking the unpalatable. And so what you've got to do, according to Mark Carney, is really protect against the unexpected happening. COVID was not unexpected, as I said. So it's about what might now happen in the world and expanding and deepening that risk register. There are, I would suggest to you, great positives that have emerged in the last two or three months not just in the United Kingdom, but elsewhere. There have been extraordinary levels of transformation and innovation by leaders, but I'm not convinced it's extended to what really the risk register should be. The risk register, which up to now has been pretty narrow and pretty self-prescribed. That, as Mark Carton has underscored, has got to change. There are great exposures to existential threats that we know about, but what, for whatever reason, are not on registers and not being taken seriously enough. So let me leave these three points with you at this starting moment. We want you to share expertise. That's what the speakers are going to do. I'm thinking about the new risk management, understanding the impacts of COVID-19, how the brains, the culture, the mindset, the behavior have really got to change in the risk business. The way it's been is not the way it's going to be in the future. And finally, finally, exploring the interconnections between the risks posed by the pandemic and the universe of other important risks. So let me introduce, first of all, each of them are going to speak for about four minutes. Please send us your questions, your thoughts, as they speak, because we've only got another 55 minutes and I want to get as many of the questions into the into the pool as we can imagine. Let me introduce firstly Colin Lawrence, Dr. Colin Lawrence, who's Senior Vice President for Strategy and Partners. Uh, Colin, the floor is yours. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, I'm on the... Um, okay. Right. So um, I've been asked to speak about um, how the macroeconomy interfaces, okay, with this virus. Um, how do we manage this? This is a highly complex, multidisciplinary problem. Um, I couldn't have believed that I'm going to be talking in the area of epidemiology. Um, probably I'm not, but I'm going to take stuff from them. But right now we're sitting with 8.7 million cases. It's probably a lot higher because of um, testing. And the number of deaths is around 500,000. 500, 
Um, and there's mass unemployment. It's much worse than the Great Depression when you look at it. So the question in a multidisciplinary thing, as Nick was saying, we have to think out the box. How do we strategically manage the global economy? How do we reduce infections? How do we prevent the loss of life at the same time that we keep the economy on track? And if you look at this first slide, I've got um, the, um, I've actually got the amount of, G how GDP growth is. And when you look at it, you see Spain down 30% GDP growth in the second quarter. The United Kingdom down 23%, and in the globe, we're down 8%. Okay, so it varies from country to country, and I want to explore what the different strategies are in different countries. Now, actually, I think that there are eight principles in this. The first one, Nick was saying regarding strategy. Governments, leaders must have a strategy. It's got to be clear, it's got to be concise, and it's got to be implemented. That means it needs governance and leadership. This should be standard in any risk management strategy. Okay. We then got to concern with more technical stuff like contagion and velocity, the speed at which this virus um, is traveling around and the way it's spreading. The second thing is what are our policies? For example, social distance policy, masks, PPI, because these drive what R would be. Okay, if we close down or shut down the economy, R will be lower. And if we open up, it will be higher. So we can see that there's a trade-off. Okay, then we've got to also worry about infrastructure. Some countries have fared better because of excess capacity in hospitals. Um, in the United Kingdom, we, we, we basically only work with um, sort of business as usual, just enough with ventilators, equipment, and ICU. We now have to plan bigger hospitals for contingent risk for the future. And we have to differentiate the, the demographics. This old versus young. The old are much more vulnerable. Um, this disease is hitting them at a much higher rate, roughly six times the young. We've got to look at geographies. Are businesses concentrated or, or dispersed? And then we've got the testing regimes. And um, we've got to look at track and trace and fiscal and monetary policy. Next slide, please. You control that. Now, here's the crux of it, and that is we've got a trade-off between death and between output loss. The first curve is if we did nothing, we'd land up with lots of people dying in the economy, um, basically not functioning. But with these targeted policies of PPI and excess capacity, we can actually bring this curve much lower where the dotted are, and we can target areas which are vulnerable. Next slide. Countries that adopted my eight criteria of good governance, good leadership, um, trusting the link between science and a multidisciplinary approach did much better in this crisis. Thank you. Colin, thank you. Um, one question which is coming in, let me just ask you this now. What are the short-term priorities for a risk or resilience manager to focus on quickly if you can, Colin? Yes, in that one slide that I showed, we want to have the trade-off. We don't want to be in a position, many countries, when you look at it, are doing both badly in terms of the number of deaths and they're doing badly in economic growth. So the risk manager should ensure that we're managing along the curve, that there's a trade-off. So just as a quick example, uh, it would be in lockdown, basically the elderly are more vulnerable, so they should not be allowed to roam around. That reduces the virus and they can work from home, okay, and um, without cutting output. On the other hand, if we keep the young at home, then output collapses. So it's finding that middle ground and optimizing the two. All right, Colin, thank you. Let me give you an idea of questions already coming in for all the other speakers as well. This from Divya, what are the improvements to be made in risk management by an organization due to the varied risks exposed by COVID-19? This from Steve is one of the main problems with traditional risk registers that they tend to look at risks singly. 
when, as the Bard says, when sorrow comes, they come not single, but in battalions. Those are the kind of framings, all of you speakers, uh, that the, the, the audience out there would like your answers to. So uh, do please embed your answers in what you're going to say now. Let's go back to Carolyn Williams now, who's the Director of Corporate Relations for the IRM. Carolyn, your view at the moment. Um, welcome to everybody who's joined the webinar here from around the world. If you don't already know IRM, then we're the leading global educator for risk management. Uh, we've got over 8,000 members in over 100 countries around the world. And uh, each year we have over 500 students who take our distance learning programs. And we also do training courses, now virtual of course, and we've just launched an introductory e-learning program as well. And we support risk management people worldwide with professional development events like this one. So pandemic risk is not new to the risk management community. It's appeared in reports like the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report and various government risk registers for decades. It's not a black swan, a completely unforeseeable event. And yet it appeared to take us all by surprise. Uh, an IRM pandemic response survey back in mid-April got nearly a thousand responses from around the world. And a copy of the summary, uh, the survey summary report is available in the download section of the web webinar screen if you're interested. So here are a few highlights of what we found. So we asked, did your organization think about pandemic risk before it happened? And we were told by 32% that no, they hadn't even considered it relevant for them. 26% had considered, hadn't considered pandemic specifically, but had looked at something with similar effects. A further 30% or so had actually had a shot at considering the impact of a pandemic. So from that last group, if you had identified pandemic as a potential risk, did you actually do anything about it? Well, one in five organisations who had identified it hadn't then done anything. A further 46% had done some stuff, and a proud 32% claimed to have had a full plan of action ready to go. We then asked how the first few weeks of the disruption had been for them. Remember, we were asking these questions back in mid-April, so everything was still rather new at that time. So a big majority, 82%, were actually satisfied with that initial response. There may have been a few problems, but in general, their business continuity plans had worked well. Good news for BCM. We went on to ask what impacts the situation had had on their work. Next slide, please. Many respondents reported the need to respond rapidly to changes in objectives and working methods, delays in projects and recruitment, distraction from their previously agreed key objectives, and also the loss of sales, revenue, and orders. So what had actually been helpful to organizations in those first few weeks? Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, well, what has been helpful? Here are the top 10 responses. And the big ones were great IT, great communications, great leadership. A personal understanding of risk and, and uncertainty had also helped people through that confusing time. And looking to the future, what are we learning from our common experience about how risk management must respond? Next slide, please. There are some themes coming out here that other speakers are going to pick up. Resilience and more resilience. Just in time may have had its day and we're going to be looking at just in case instead. Strategic risk. Looking back at my first slide where risk professionals had identified pa pandemic as a potential risk, but their organization had then done nothing about it. What was going on there? I suspect my fellow panelists, as well as our audience, will have some ideas about that. Complexity, risk quantification, supply chain risk, all going to be important. And do come to IRM if you want to raise your game in any of these areas. Lastly, next slide, please. I was worried that the all embracing pandemic agenda was obscuring other risks that were still out there. So we asked about that and our, our, our respondents agreed. We still have to tackle climate change and cyber risk. We still have to face natural disasters and live through geopolitical upheaval. 
We've been lucky enough not to have suffered major disruptions of critical national infrastructure this time. Mental health problems, fraud, solar storms, the next pandemic are all there still waiting for us. And we just have to tackle all these in a post-pandemic, economically disrupted world. And there are also the merciless interconnections between these risks, which Martin is going to talk about later. Risk management has never been such a hot topic. It provides the rational connection between the science, which of course is never just a straightforward answer, and with politics, which indicates our objectives and our values on a society level. And we all have to get better at it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And I'm, I'm tempted to ask, do you believe those numbers you were given, and actually people were rather optimistic, over-optimistic about what their the response would was and would be? In other words, they were making mm -hmm. it feel better than it really was, quickly? Yeah, I think um, this say this was mid-April, so we were like a month in, in, in a lot of economies into a lockdown. Um, I think people were, were on a bit of a sort of um, high, uh, almost, um, and I think now we're seeing um, some organisations and strains are beginning to show. But we're also seeing others who are have actually done really well and have actually seized the opportunities. Yeah. Uh, just picking up on your last point, a question here from Michael to, for all of you to bear in mind. The World Economic Forum only listed a pandemic at number 10 on its top mm -hmm. 10 risks, and yet it's a tier one threat for the UK. But the issue mm -hmm. here is how can that disparity be explained? We'll come back to that, but I want to give you an idea of the kind of questions already. Let's now move on to emerging COVID regulatory landscape. What is now emerging very clearly? We've heard already that just in time is now becoming just in case. What about the way regulatory environment is changing? We're joined by Neil Ryan, who's a COO of uh, Correlatives, um, which is a fintech company. Neil. Thank you, Nick. Um, so uh, just to introduce our company very quickly, we are a, a, an Irish uh, reg tech based uh, company that tracks uh, regulatory change, the main regulators uh, globally, and we uh, structure rate and visualize that data for our clients. So in, in terms of what the company did and referring back, Nick, to what you said earlier on, th this was really an issue that went from, if we go to the next page, a local uh, issue to a global issue. And part of the, the, some of the questions that you raised earlier on, Nick also talked about the fact that you need to think not singularly, but more broadly. And one of the advantages that we had with the, just in terms of the normal business that we did was that we were covering all of these different jurisdictions globally. So what we could do is we could actually collate information from regulators, be they conduct regulators, prudential regulators, data or cyber regulators, and we could actually see across the world certain patterns emerging and certain themes emerging. And on the next page, what we do is we, we just give you some examples. For example, early in the uh, um, pandemic growth, we saw countries like uh, Korea, uh, the SEC in the States and HKMA in Hong Kong talk about the fact that what they wanted to do was work together to ride out the storm. They wanted to, to tinker with various different elements of regulation or they wanted to monitor uh, market progress. But over time, what we saw was actually a change in the theme as the effects hit the economy across the sector. And on the next page, what we can see is really the evolution of the main four themes that we looked at from over 80,000 records globally. What you can see on going from left to right is that there are very strong, but slightly different uh, number one, two, three, and four. So I've just presented the five different themes. Reporting is still a major theme, but as you can see during uh, March, April, May time, and you'll reflect certainly in, in Western Europe, there was a lot of questioning around insurance and does insurance actually cover um, the pandemic uh, closure and the effect on business. Financial crime and data also figured. But what's interesting to see from this is that the uh, focus is not for prudential and, and conduct regulators solely on capital requirements. You're seeing different elements evolve and you're seeing different themes than we would see more generally from the themes that these regulators would apply globally. And then when we look at the next uh, page, what we're seeing is in the last month or so, a focus, although it's not on the top four themes, a focus on operational resilience. But we're also seeing, Nick, a blurring of that definition. In other words, operational resilience is interpreted by some people as 
does the organization react? Does it have the IT infrastructure? Does it have the organizational uh, architecture to support operations? But what you're also seeing is regulators uh, moving into the questions around financial stability, and we would expect that to continue. So the definition of operational resilience, we think, over, between now and Christmas will actually change. And then lastly, what we're seeing is more general themes, uh, non-COVID related emerge. And some of those that are ESG and cyber and climate led programs will begin to influence, we think, uh, the way that COVID uh, is interpreted by the regulators and therefore how they actually manifest the, the monitoring focus and regulation of their clients going forward. Thank you, Neil. Just before I move on to David Stark from Marsh, one question here, which I think uh, I should ask you at this point, what extent is pandemic the risk versus political responses becoming the risk itself? In other words, the different, the, the, the risk actually of knowing what the issue is, but how it's all then going to be handled by those who we expect to handle it, like the politicians. I think, I think that's a very good question. And it also links back to some of the points that, that, uh, that Caroline made uh, in the previous slides. I think what you're going to see is the same general global themes, but different emphasis in different locations. So there may be, for example, in some jurisdictions, more emphasis uh, on climate-led programs. In other words, in, in other countries, there'd be concern, and I see some questions that came up around IT security and cyber. And in other places, there might be a more balanced ESG program approach. But what I think you will see is globally, uh, um, common themes emerging, but the application of those themes has been different and therefore been able to look at what these different, how these different countries are approaching it for a company or a firm is going to become more important and been able to track that and compare and contrast is going to be more important as to where the emphasis is. Thank you, Neil. Well, that, bear that one in mind from David, what extent is pandemic the risk versus political responses? Because it shows how what Neil has just said about the blurring of operational resistance becoming a, a serious issue. You've got to really pull apart the definition of risk and resilience. Now, let's move on with how we define operational resilience in a COVID world, how it's changing. Let's go to David Stark, who's a director at Marsh. David. Thank you, Nick. Um, so, first slide, please, uh, Ray. Um, I just I wanted to start off by presenting some research uh, into corporate resilience that we conducted uh, jointly at Marsh with Cranfield University in 2018. And some of you may recognise the curves. Uh, it, it updated research undertaken by Knight and Petty originally for Oxford University in the 1990s, which looked at the impact of major crises on listed company share price and the positive effect um, that mature resilience had in place. So our research uh, looked at the period 2008 to 2018 and particularly focused in on 23 companies who'd experienced corporate crises. So the consolidated results are on the slide there that you can see. Um, and generally speaking, the companies with good resilience, we, we termed as thrivers, and they experienced a 5% uptick in share price in comparison to their peer group, um, whilst those with insufficient resilience practices had a 12% fall in share price, again, compared to their peers. So the thrivers generally had two key characteristics. They'd invested in resilience pre-crisis and during the crisis, they really exhibited great uh, control and command of it. And that really does speak to what Carolyn's research showed for really good communications at this COVID time as well. But on the next slide, if we can, I just want to show that COVID is a crisis unlike any other. So over the last six months, as all the speakers have been saying, it's really reset our thinking and tested our organisational assumptions in all industries around strategies, plans for risk and resilience and the execution of those plans. So I've summarised what we, uh, Marsh, have put together as four key learnings uh, in the diagram. Um, so from the top and then moving clockwise around the diagram, um, there's generally been inconsistent data and projections on the epidemic and the economic implications. So organisations have had to make critical strategy operations, financial decision making without having full access to data or assessments. Um, secondly, many organisations don't know enough about their supply chain, sadly, uh, and sometimes even it's the case that they don't know enough about their interdependencies between their own operational sites. 
um, as listed at the bottom, uh, BCM planning has generally, in our experience, not been up to the tasks. So prior resilience planning, it's been too narrowly focused on physical premises uh, and physical recovery, and not this 100% work from home that we're all experiencing at the minute. And then as listed in the final quadrant, there's been variability in the policy responses, as Neil's mentioned, uh, between countries. Uh, so for any multinational companies, that's giving a lot of uh, uncertainty and potential volatility across the whole of the value chain. So I now would like to move on to some key um, focus areas to get the organization back into control. So these are summarized in the slide um, and uh, essentially I want to start from top left on the workforce impact. It's centered around estimating the workforce availability and when teams or locations can return to work safely and I do underscore that term safely. It's really got to be robust, it's got to think about mental health and well-being as well. The next consideration then is the return to work plan development. So ensuring that you know and meet your obligations to your employees, the regulators, if you're a regulated business, and also your insurers as well as the workforce returns. Moving to the right hand side, um, it start thinking about business restoration and reinvention planning. So it's critical because your risk landscape has changed so much that it's reassessed it's the controls are reinvestigated and they're compared to your appetite level, which of course will have changed as well. So there needs to be robust resilience in place around that so you can withstand disruptions if they're to occur, which may well be the case as we approach a second wave. And then underpinning all of that is business impact forecasting. Many of you in uh, the IRM survey uh, focused on the fact that quantitative risk analysis is so important and we agree totally with that. So projecting the operational financial implications of risk scenario to the financial key perform indica performance indicators sorry, that you have in your organisation, whether they be cash flow, profit and loss, balance sheet, strength. And then furthermore, planning um, risk improvements with cost benefit analysis in mind is key. I now want to move on to the next slide, which just summarises the key considerations for the future. So the action plan, the three things to think about. Uh, number one, take stock and prepare for the second wave. It may come, we've already seen some indicators of that in Germany, in China. So be prepared for that. Look at what happened, the lessons learned, how could they be improved to have more robustness, more slack, more agility in the system. Secondly, uh, you need to develop and implement plans for return to work. So you've got to balance the, the factors of health, safety, well-being, productivity as well, and communication, not only to your own staff, but to your customers and the stakeholders that are so critical to your business. And then thirdly, you fundamentally need to re-examine risk and resilience approach and the adequacies for the future. And that comes straight back to your point, Nick, at the start, around that reimagining risk. Okay, so those are the key things that I wanted to talk about. I'm going to hand over to Martin next, who's going to talk about uh, the interconnectivity. Okay, but David, just before you do, I just want to ask one thing. Are you putting down, putting the failure to read risk based on your work as down to complacency or denial? Uh, I think there's a degree of risk blindness, if I'm honest with you uh, there, Nick. So um, obviously uh, the pandemic is a societal risk, but all organisations have suffered the consequences of it. As um, you mentioned and Carolyn did as well, we have had pandemics elsewhere in the world, whether it's SARS, whether it's MERS, but there's been a degree of blindness around that and the uncertainty on the implications and fundamental rocking of the assumptions in organizations so there's there's an element there of both in honesty net all right well that's what we have to do work out whether we can reverse the blindness on mm -hmm. this uh, making a medical uh, analogy there and uh, i don't claim to be an ophthalmologist let's move on david thank you for the moment we've got plenty of questions coming in let's go to martin massey who is uh, um, uh, the Vice President of Strategy and Partners as well. Um, Martin, you're going to talk about connected risks. Yes, hi. Yeah, yeah. so we, um, we've heard from the other speakers about the macro um, policies, risk management, regulatory and operational resilient issues associated with COVID. Um, it's clear that organisations must be better prepared and have fully agile mitigation and contingency plans in place. Um, 
I will now focus on the need for the new risk management paradigm required to deal with systemic, what we call gray swans events and interconnected risks facing the world. Um, I did actually join AIG post financial crisis. Uh, so that was also another gray swan. Um, so I have a lot of experience which I can uh, touch on. Um, in order to build resilience, economies and organizations need the capability to anticipate key events from emerging trends, co constantly adapt to change and be capable of rapidly bouncing back from adversity. From the IRM survey, it's evident that risk management needs to be fully integrated into the DNA of the business, needs to be elevated as a critical process that supports strategic decision making and drives improved risk culture and risk maturity. Businesses also need to improve risk management tools and processes that focus on mission critical business services. And key areas include managing emerging risks, designing integrated stress and scenario tests, building uh, business continuity and operational resilience plans. And as we have seen from the COVID crisis, improve aggregation of risk data and information. It's also critical to support decision making. So a lot of the themes that we've seen in the previous uh, presentations. Um, we're now facing uh, into a period of big governance, big regulation resulting from COVID. We're also seeing increased nationalization, diverging national and international objectives, trade wars and disputes, which will make it more difficult to respond to risk on a global basis. Some of the connected risks and knock-on effects of the crisis are shown in the slide. Um, so just some examples, uh, accelerated digital transformation, which is moving the world uh, toward increased uh, technological innovation, and online collaboration, but this in turn is also leading to increased cybercrime and data fraud. ESG and climate have been mandated as key requirements of the re recovery. For example, the EU is making emissions cuts a prerequisite for airline bailouts. In the US, a group of more than 300 companies, including Microsoft, have recently called on the federal government to pass carbon taxes to put green projects at the heart of the coronavirus recovery plans. The World Economic Forum predicts a prolonged global economic recession that will lead to further surges in bankruptcies, failure of certain industries and sectors, and high levels of unemployment. We have seen significant supply and demand shocks. Some supply chains are spinning incredibly hard to keep up, whilst others, such as manufacturers, are being forced to dump down, ramp down. One of the main impacts will be the shrinking or shorter supply chain footprint as companies seek a different cost and resilience trade-off. So we move to the last slide. Um, so risk globally is now its highest level that we've probably seen in history. The pandemic is leading to an unprecedented number of interconnected systemic risks. Future macro policy and regulatory responses may further exacerbate these risks into unintended ways. Globally, coordinated response obviously is key. We need to achieve common goals and shared objectives across the entire ecosystem. Business needs to reassess, adapt, and transform their business models for the new norm. Their strategies must take into consideration further pandemic waves, supply chain resilience, ESG, market volatility, and changing consumer behaviors. Risk management frameworks and tools have failed to deal with extreme events from an operational risk perspective. We must also eliminate human bias in risk response planning. We need to embrace diversity of thinking as a priority Organizations need to review and transform their risk culture and resilience capability of the future. This must, be, must become an enabler for harvesting new business opportunities. Um, so that's sort of a summary, really, of some of the things that we've seen from the other speakers. So thanks for your attention. I'll now hand back to Nick for the panel session. Thank you, Martin. Um, what I'm taking away is, and this is my own personal uh, assessment, is that tools have failed to deal with events. I think that's a truism, but that's something which still has to be drummed in to the business of risk. It ain't going to be like uh, it's been assumed to be up until, say, January or February this year. The blurring of operational uh, positives now uh, and the blurring of operational resilience. The importance now, not just of just in time, but just in case that there are thrivers who can actually adapt and adapt amazingly effectively providing they've been thinking about it beforehand. The risk blindness that we heard about as well, risk blindness, can we reverse that in any way? But overall, the, the message of must re reassess and adapt. Now, um, because of the system we're using, it's not gonna be easy to actually bring in all the panelists, but what I'd like to do is summarize a couple of points that have been made here 
and then ask one of you and just jump in if you can to answer the the, the core question from dr jimmy um stephen is saying how do we shift company focus to the long-term contingency planning which is often seen as a distraction of the bottom line and that's the reason for asking that question risk the real risk issues being seen as a distraction to the bottom line anna comments about looking at the opportunity to re-educate to look at new ways of structuring our businesses that could give a cash advantage in other words there's money to be made if you get risk right but this uh, from dr jimmy how do the panel feel believe firms can balance the costs of becoming much more resilient to radical uncertainties and extreme policy responses to them with the inevitable enormous impact of the lockdown on financial resilience with recession, credit costs, solvency, etc. Who'd like to jump in? Colin, we haven't heard from you uh, for 20 minutes. What's your view? Okay, there are a lot of questions. Um, Indeed, okay. many more. Um, okay, let me just come in. Well, well, Colin's thinking if you'd like me to, Nick. Thank I you, yes. Uh, yeah, so it's David Stark again here. Um, I think uh, that is a, a great question. So from my perspective, from UK listed companies, as you know, the UK Corporate Governance Code tweaked a little while ago to include things such as viability statements. Now, in my opinion, that's a really brilliant move. But I, st I think still in this current state... Pre I don't think we're hearing uh, David at the moment. David, can you speak again? Let's try with your microphone. David, I think you were speaking a moment ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, try again, please. Yeah, OK. So uh, the question from Jimmy about how do companies shift focus to longer term? Um, good question. And I think it, it's structured around the integration of risk analysis with financial planning analysis and strategic analysis. So um, in, in my experience, very often risk and resilience is focused on the short term because it hasn't had the right conversations with people perhaps in strategic planning, which would look at maybe five or 10 years hence, and certainly financial planning as well, um, to building those financial priorities. So UK Corporate Governance Code has helped with viability statements, but I think there's a long way to go. In a lot of organizations, viability statement and risk analysis is undertaken by financial analysts, and the risk uh, community may not be directly involved. I think they need to be, and in my opinion, there's a bigger role to be had and a more important role for risk and resilience managers going forward. Thank you, David. Does anyone want to come in? Colin? Well, I agree with that, but I want to add on um, another point, a key point. We continually harp on shareholder value as the key goal of the corporate. But this crisis has flushed out almost like a stress test, is that there's a lot of issues regarding inequality regarding health care and um, leading to high inequality and i think that corporates have to shift now to being much more accountable on their long-term plans regarding green technological investment um, digitalization and so on but also in doing that it, they should be encouraged in fact incentivized not on shareholder value but on a much broader set of um, stakeholders, um, such as contribution to green, such as helping poorer families get re-educated and retooled. Unless they do that, we face another risk, which has not been discussed, but which the coronavirus has flushed out, and, and that is fragmentation, okay? De-regionalization. So for example, in this crisis, it's a global issue. So we need to incentivize CEOs to focus on this globally, maximizing stakeholder value. If I may, um, I'll just, anyone else want to come in? But if I may, the future of the corporation project from the British Academy, they've been having a summit which ended literally eight minutes ago. I, I can tell you that there's an enormous momentum now behind everything you've just said, Colin, a massive shift in what the purpose or is going to be of corporations. It's not to exploit people, it's actually to help people. And what you can feel is a major shift going on. Now, who else would like to come in? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see all of you. So just jump in if you'd like to add anything, particularly on this issue of risk and the kind of risk assessment that there is now, the kind of risk register needed is a quote, distraction from the bottom line as Stephen put it anyone want to come in 
you know, just um, I just want to add to one of the most important tools that actually have been developed um, over the last few years or post a financial crisis has really been focused on emerging risk management, developing frameworks um, so that uh, there's a separate governance around that. And, all, and you talked about the risk radar, but uh, really dynamic companies have separate emerging risks that are managed, have separate accountability, and they often do a lot of research uh, around how to manage those risks. So, for example, pandemic, most, most advanced companies, especially in financial services, would have already done quite a bit of work around uh, modeling pandemic scenarios on their business. So I think it's it's having those uh, integrated governance structures that deal with emerging trends and emerging risks is, is very, very key. And look at long-term like, long -term trends. Thank you, Martin. Anyone else quickly? All right, well, let me put to you what JJ has just picked up on on that, that critical issue of risk blindness, David, from you. How can risk blindness be overcome? Is blindness actually the right word or is it is it just blinkered? rather than blindness. Blindness is obviously affecting the eyes. The eyes can yeah. still work, but it's something over it. I'm not being semantic here, but no. obviously you want to find it's a It's a colloquial term, to be honest, Nick. So yeah, I'm sure quite a few of the, uh, the, the members will know what I mean. But it brings in elements such as heuristics, so availability, representativeness, that many of the people who are listening will be aware of what I mean. And I, I was just scrolling through the chat, actually, while you were talking there. And, and forgive me, I can't remember the person who raised the question, but one person quite rightly said, well, is it actually blindness? Is it blindness from the West um, versus the Asian countries that responded well? And I think that's a very good point, yeah. because when we think about SARS and MERS um, and the general response in, uh, in many of the Asian countries, take, uh, take Singapore, for instance, have performed really well. Um, and they've implemented things really effectively because there have been a degree of lessons learned uh, and uh, a, a better perception of what the risk could be and the implications of that risk. So an important one for me. So I agree with the person who raised that point. Thank you for that one. But let me let me just pick that up and say um, in the east, in the east, particularly in Korea, in Taiwan and Singapore, they made it clear that complacency right at the beginning was no way forward. They had to act. What is there, not just on COVID, but on every risk, the need to act decisively, hopefully be, even before it happens. David, just pick it up as you just picked it up from the chat line. Yeah, I think that acting decisively is center to a good resilience policy. Everyone will be familiar that um, not all risk can be foreseen. Um, uh, not all uh, circumstances can be foreseen. So having a degree of agility, I, I don't know, the, uh, raising another point, um, there's, in my experience, there haven't been enough slack, there haven't been enough reserves, there haven't been enough um, contingency in many organisations, as much as there should have been for these kind of issues. So I think, again, I'll go back to my point about the risk manager, resilience manager, having more robust conversations with their senior counterparts in the organisation. What are the implications of these risks and what can we do and what do we need to do to have some level of preparedness in place there? Uh, Neil, can I come to you? Because there's one question from Muzamil. What are the top priorities for any financial institution at this time? The focus on critical processes or risk assessment? Neil. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Nick, and, and thank you for the question as well. And looking, I've been looking like David through the, the, the list and I can see that there's uh, two or three different camps emerging. I, I, I think the, without sounding trite about it, um, the issue is that the, the risk assessment process has to be reviewed from the bottom up. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we t David talked about blindness. That's actually uh, occurring in a lot of cases and lessons have been learned from these things before that people believe the process rather than actually, you know, been alive to what's happening in the connected risk environment that Martin was talking about earlier on. I think this is, these are, as Colin said, th this is really two or three crises mixed together. The pandemic is a, is a health crisis. There is a financial crisis going on in the background uh, because of the, the effect on, on the economy. But there's also the underlying crisis that has been lingering for the last 10 years in the financial system and whether there actually is real resilience there or whether QE programs globally are just artificially keeping prices up. What's likely to happen based on my experience, and I, I, I worked for the Irish government when the Irish economy, I was the chief risk officer for the Irish economy uh, after the, the, the country went into the program. Uh, what, what 
what we had to do in the civil service in the Department of Finance is rip up the rule books and start again. What and was it that, like ripping up the rule book, though? It's not easy for public servants, is it, in that situation? If you worked in an organization and qualified for the top, you tend to uh, um, default to conformity. I, well, I think the interesting observation I'd have about that is you can make a lot more changes when there's a when there's a crisis on than mm -hmm. when they're open. And even during the, this current crisis, we've seen accelerations of certain programs in, in various different countries. We've seen uh, um, uh, rules been been put into abeyance because there's, there's a health need that needs to be uh, adjusted to. And, and equally in the financial market, it's the same uh, sort of thing. So from from a risk assessment point of view, and, and, and just to give you, uh, if I may, one example, I remember being very impressed when I was studying years and years ago with the case study that Harvard had put together of Shell. And in the early 1980s, Shell's economist uh, came up with the scenario where the, the, uh, the Iron Curtain would fall and what effect that would have on um, uh, oil prices and Shell in particular, I, I guess, as a company and where they would invest. That sort of very high level strategic thinking has to be what permeates uh, companies, firms and, and financial organisations going forward. If they're not thinking at that global level, they're not thinking properly. Let me just give you a personal anecdote. I was in East Berlin the night the wall came down three or four hours before. No one had any expectation it would happen until someone gave a member of the Politburo a piece of paper, which he read out. And that was the end of East Germany. But no one could have seen that on the risk register. But let me pick up um, on that point of finance, if I may, because another point, and maybe Colin, I can come to you next uh, because of the financial focus here. This from Jonathan. Why has there been such little debate on the different requirements of financial resilience and operational resilience? Have chief operating officers failed to influence companies' agendas to the same extent that CFOs have? Who has the best skill set to fill the gaps that there clearly are here? Colin first. Yeah, I think that in corporations, this is really multidisciplinary because if you don't have contingent plans in place, let's say a COO would put in place those contingent plans, plans or risk managers, and it's got to have the financing. So actually a good CEO will take a um, you know, multidisciplinary um, approach. If it's a bank, it's got to meet liquidity requirements. Um, it's got to meet capital requirements and it's got to have stress testing of all of these. So it's not one or the other. Now, what often happens, it's a very good question, because of political power in an organization, you get one dictating what the outcome should be at the cost of the other. So someone might be maximizing the share price. Someone might be maximizing the response or the best response to the regulator. Um, or someone else might be maximizing their own mobility. And because people have not got aligned self-interest, okay, or incentives, then you get bad outcomes. And that's what's happened in this crisis. Going back, um, Nick, you made the point on politics, which comes into this. You can see now, for example, in the United States, Actually, the coronavirus doesn't discriminate what political party you are, yet it's now become a major political situation. The government are just ignoring it, whereas the Democrats are using it. It should not be a political issue, but it is. So we've got to sort out the politics, and that's through incentive, op op optimal incentivization. Do you make a point about every officer having his own uh, response, his or her own responsibility? Anyone else want to come in about CFO versus COO? In other words, this conflict between money and responsibility and risk. Anyone want to come in? I can't see you all. There's Carolyn here. Um, I, I'll just add to this that this has been the debate behind the enterprise risk management um, issue uh, in that uh, the chief risk officer in the, in the picture, uh, who is um, you know, of an equal status to both the COO and and the um, CFO, so that the the risk the, the view of risk is that is that balancing that intelligence that takes these these different things into account is properly um, uh, accounted for at level. 
Um, I think there's some amazing questions. A lot of um, comments coming up in in the chat, which is you know in, instructive in itself. There's a good some great conversations going on. Yes, I'm sorry, I can't reflect it. Or I'm doing my best. I think oh. we've been through about 15 questions so far, which is good. But uh, coming down particularly to this core issue, and I, we've got about eight minutes to run at the moment. About um, and I was going to put this as your the last question to you, but Stephen has now brought it up. Is it the case that there's just not enough people with the skills and aptitude to manage companies, particularly on risk, in all aspects? Who would like to come in on that? Shall we say yes? Is it the case? <laughs> There aren't just enough people. In other words, the people who are there at the moment may not be the right people to take this forward. David? That, to be honest, so I do dimensions to it. You know, the risk managers, many risk managers are on the call. Some of you will be doing a brilliant job in your own organization, but you know how hard it is to get an audience with the C-suite um, if you're not a CRO yourself. Um, and then having that robust, rigorous conversation, which cuts across disciplines. And I think Colin mentioned that point, and I really agree with him. Not having a conversation with just one, um, let's say, department, but the cross-functional departments, and that really, really rigorous debate. Um, that's important from the human side of risk, but I also want to flag the data side of risks as well. And I think as a risk uh, community, we've got some way to go to using better data feeds to inform our proactivity uh, and our response to risk. So I sometimes use that in the analogy of driving a car. Sometimes in some organizations, it feels as though the risk function may be transfixed on the rear view mirror rather than the dashboard and rather than the uh, front windscreen. So I think there needs to be a combination of both. We need to use uh, human factors. Um, the organizational culture is so important, but also using data to really improve that proactivity and that foresight around risk and resilience. Colin, let me just pick this up with you, if I may. Um, anyone else want to jump in again? I can't see you all. But Colin, given your own background, that, that phrase there from David, just at risk officers even getting an audience with the C-suite, isn't that the heart of it? Getting those points right to the top so that well, they're not masked? Yeah, most definitely. I think that that's a critical point. Let me put it slightly differently. Risk can choose to be in the ex post world after something's happened and ask to review something or ask to do a compliance report. But it could also be ex ante, which means before a strategy is adopted. And I think that is where risk management has to move to, to get influence in the C-suite. It's got to be there to help and ensure that the strategy actually takes account of the risk capacity, which includes the balance sheet, it includes all contingent risks, et cetera. So definitely the CRO should have a, should be in the C-suite. Um, I think we're moving to that. I also just make one other point. Often our risk in the risk management profession is too narrow for what's happening, and we should broaden it to encompass uncertainty. The difference between uncertainty and risk is in risk, as Frank Knight said, we know the probabilities and we know the outcomes. But in uncertainty, we don't even know what the probabilities are and we don't even know what the events are. Now, risk management actually should move into a discipline of managing uncertainty for the corporation. This is what this pandemic has flushed out. But let me just press you and then I'll go to the others. What about the risks for risk managers in putting their heads out on the block on some of these issues. In other words, the very human thing. You have a certain way as chief risk officer, that's all we expect when the reality is moving in so many different directions, as Mark Carney underlined about 90 minutes ago. Quickly, uh, Colin. Yeah, I think a, a risk manager also has to learn some um, right brain skills as well, and not only the left brain. So say you do a computation, it's how you express it how you go and discuss it with the CEO. And your process is critical in getting something done. But if you stay narrow and you stay in your silo and you just come out with a report that isn't of relevance to the C-suite, you'll be shut out of it. So it's thinking ahead. A risk manager should be doing that. Neil, risk managers actually taking a risk now because of the nature of risk that they're meant to be reporting on. Sure. Um, 
I, you know, I, I, I think that the, the, the biggest risk that there is in the current pandemic is that actually the health, uh, the health crisis is masking other issues. And if people don't aren't alert to that and don't see similarities between the, the global financial crisis of 2009 to 2011 uh, and the consequences of that, um, they're probably missing a trick. I think that the second thing that I just pick up on and, and, and just refer to very, very quickly, Colin made a point earlier on about the, the, the corporation, and, and I think you mentioned it as well, Nick. Uh, I, I think one of the questions that will arise is, what is the purpose of society? And how do, how do corporations fit into the fabric of society? So I think there will be a broader view taken than just shareholder value. There'll be a broader view taken than just a firm. There is a risk, however, that regionalization and a, decay, a decline of globalization will take place, which will have spillover effects. But as I mentioned earlier on, I think you have to think at those sort of levels in order to properly assess what these connected risks could possibly be in the future. Thank you. Just before we go to Carolyn, a comment here from Russell. Is there a danger that organizations, risk management processes can overcomplicate risk response when what is needed is a more agile response, initially delivering the minimum viable product? One part of the organization we haven't talked about in the last hour are boards. Quickly, all of you, what about the responsibility of boards to grip this, given that there are now accountability and regulatory issues which are even deeper? And making them even more accountable quickly, Martin. Please, thirty seconds each. There's a lack of understanding of some of the risks that are presented at boards, uh, whether it's cyber, whether it's climate. So there definitely there needs to be more uh, ownership and, and accountability and, and, and training, I suppose, by, by senior executives and board, board members. David. Uh, yeah, I think we're, we're fortunate in the UK. Good guidance, actually. So the FRC. Say again, David. Sorry if you can we'll hear me now. Think, yeah, um, there's some good guidance actually from the FRC on the effectiveness of boards, and risk is one of the central questions that needs to be addressed. So uh, there is some um, information out there. I think it go, go back to my point about that robustness, that challenge that needs to come from the risk manager um, as well. Uh, Neil. The issue of boards. Okay. Um, let me come in over here then. Okay, please do, Colin. Yes. Let me make a point um, on boards. Um, I tend to agree. Look, it, it's written in the code of conduct that boards are there for oversight. What does that mean? Um, and I want to give an example. The chief risk officer comes and presents something to the board. Uh, I once, when I was at the regulator as an executive, I, I basically showed them a sheet of paper and said, if you got this report, what do you think about it? And what I did was the report showed value at risk. They said, well, that's a value at risk. I said, well, what does it mean? Okay. And actually I threw it down and said, it means absolutely nothing. This was a the value at risk taken during the housing crisis, which measured nothing really. So often you get these canned reports coming from the executive to the non-executive. The non-executive should be demanding that I want to see this. For example, in the crisis, I want to see a lockdown position. I want to know how many workers are home, where are we going to be, and challenge all the time. Challenge the executives to really account. It's not only challenging them, it's working with them but you're doing it from an independent viewpoint. And I also think that the independence shouldn't only be to the shareholders. It should be independence for all stakeholders, et cetera. Neil, just you've, you've come back up. Again, this responsibility of the boards, far greater responsibility than perhaps many are assuming. I, I think that there's an opportunity now for boards to define their vision about where they see the company sitting in society. And I think that that will form a framework for their, an overarching framework for the approach that the company will take, as, as a number of other speakers have said, and how that will permeate down in terms of how they analyze the risk for that vision. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much indeed, particularly for keeping to time. Much appreciated. We're bang on time at the moment, just a couple of minutes to go. Just before I hand to Carolyn, I was talking to the senior, a very senior board member of a very large financial institution who's just joined it, and he was talking about uh, how he was having to deal with risk and the chief risk officer and he said in the end it's about not worrying him 
not frightening him because otherwise he'll go into a, um, a self-protecting ball. I was amazed by that, but maybe that's the, the conflict that all of you in the risk management business are confronting at the moment. You know what needs to be done, but actually the systems are not flexible and nimble and agile and receptive enough. Caroline, the, the floor is yours finally. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Nick. And uh, that concludes our webinar today. So on behalf of IRM, I'd like to thank uh, Ray Nolte and Stratagem Partners for their support in making this event happen. Uh, I'd like to thank all our individual presenters, uh, Dr. Colin Lawrence, Neil Ryan, David Stark and Martin Massey for sharing their expertise on this very hot topic on a very hot day. And a particular thank you to Dr. Nick Gowing for keeping us all in order and to time and a process that he very wisely started several days ago <laughs> behind the scenes. Uh, don't worry, you can access a recording of this webinar if you want to hear it again or recommend it to a colleague. Look for the post-event email. And thanks also to my colleague Rory Poole, who manages our webinar events at IRM, and to Caroline Iron, who's been looking after the questions behind the scenes. You'll find copies of the slides used during this webinar in the handouts area of the webinar screen if you haven't found it already, along with additional documents that our speakers have uploaded for you. So we've just had a very, very fast moving tour of the post pandemic world. IRM's firmly of the view that the risk community has a vital job to do to help our recovery and build our resilience against future events, for they will surely happen. Please take a look at our website, see how we are providing education, professional development and support around the world. Thank you very much and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>